Um, so you, uh, so you're a Scot then that's moved, you to, moved to Paris. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed. Yeah, I came in '91, so very beginning '91. So uh, um, I've been and I actually worked. I worked for Electronic D2. First year I was here, I worked for another another designer, mm. and that other designer I worked for Electronic D2 when I was working for him. Yeah. So, and I went off on my own. But, so uh, it was three months, but it's been the longest three months in the history of the planet. I don't think I'm moving now. <laughs> uh, anyway. So what, what can I do for you, Miles? I guess you saw that uh, the Lacey hard drive takes a main starring role as a protagonist of the film. It's inter interesting the pronunciation because, uh, funny enough, here in France, we say Lassie, like the dog. Oh, and think, okay. And I think in America, they sort of go lay C as if it was two different words. Because it's got a capital uh, C in the middle, hasn't it? Yeah, but it's because in French, it means the company. Oh, I, mean, I see. It's, it's two different words. Oh. C, C, I, E is the French version of co, C, O. Okay, I've got you. So it's the company. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, so it's been a big part of my technological life I think dealing with that hard drive so and also I mean the main premise of the film is uh, I've all the information about me and about the film is stored on the hard drive uh, therefore it's sort of like a facsimile of myself um, and it's in fact the hard drive that goes on the journey rather than myself anyway I'll talk to you uh, about the design so I mean how did the Lacey design come about? Uh, and specific, I mean, I'm specifically talking about the, the one with a heat sink ribs on it. But then, I mean, I'd, it'd be great for you to talk about Lacey design in general, you know. There was, there's three big ranges that I've done for Lacey. One is the what they call the design by Neil Poulton range, because he couldn't come up with a better name for it, which is those bl the, the range of black shiny boxes of lots of different sizes which came out about a year before everybody else did black shiny boxes of lots of different sizes. Uh, then there's the rugged ones, which are the orange ones with the orange bumper, which everybody uses as a... Actually, that's the one that the, most of the film people use. They stick it in an envelope and get it baked across town with the rushes. It's a very, very popular product there. And that's been on the market since... I don't know, I think it would... 2006, I think it came out, first one. So it's 10 years that's been on the market. Now the one you were interested in, the one with the the, um, the ribs on the side, which was uh, called the little big disc. That's the one we're talking about. Miles, um, it's, the big... it's LB it's LBD. Not, it's not the little big disc. No, it's it's, it's the full size one, I think. Okay, the the full size D two, right? Because the full that that was actually something again that if you look right back to electronic D two um, in about nineteen ninety. Two or 1993, I did a drive for them which was called the Cock C O Q, which I'll send you. You can find this one on the internet, but I can send you pictures of it. And the Cock was this big, tall, vertical hard drive in black plastic and with a big circular green eye, not a blue eye, big circular green eye. And uh, if you looked at it in, in um, sort of front view, it kind of looks like a, like a big black dick, basically, is what it looks like in the front view. And um, at the time, the, the, um, when I designed this, the guy from Electronic D2, which was also the guy, Felix Pro, who was the head of Lassie afterwards, he said to me, it looks like a big dick in French. He says, what do, you call, what's a, what do you call a dick in French? And I said, well, you call it a cock. And he goes, well, okay, we'll, we'll call it a cock. And so we changed the spelling to C-O-Q, like the French cock. And we, put, we did this graphic with a, like a symbol of a rooster. So that product was immensely successful, um, really, really huge success, both commercially and in terms of um, the market. And, and the, um, it got in a Playboy, it got in the covers of magazines and all sorts of stuff. So in, I think in 2001, I'm getting around to it, what you are, are talking about, the range you're interested in with the big blue lamps, that was from, I think, 2001. And what happened was that Philippe Spoux, who'd been the guy who'd been the head of the company in Electronic D2, who'd taken a back seat, he'd been kind of ousted, and he came back to the company. This is sort of like a, you know, Steve Jobs coming back to Apple. And um, he wanted me to redesign, well, to design a new product for them, 
And basically the idea was he wanted me to update the, the, the cock. So the redesign of the cock became this big rectangle, vertical rectangle with the blue eye on the top. So it's like this sort of um, monolithic presence with this eye which is watching you or not watching you or lighting up or whatever. Um, and one of the big th the thing about it was one these products were one of the first ones to stick them to, to go vertically on a hard drive instead of going horizontally. In the wonderful world of hard drive designs, there's maybe um, not a lot of uh, you know sort of like uh, m you know maneuvering space because in general people want um, their hard drives to be well as uh, inobtrusive as possible. They want the smallest thing with the highest performance, fastest. Um, connection possible and the biggest capacity for the least amount of money so it's kind of a it's not a, a very um uh what's the word I'm problems with problems in english it's not a, a fantastically re rewarding type of uh, work to do because people in general don't go oh wow i love your hard drive you just sort of like plug it in and use it and sort of forget about it but anyway that range which started in 2001 which we call the d2 range because the company Electronic D2 was, well, that's where it comes from. So that whole D2 range, um, so I've just started in 2001 and just kept evolving and evolving and evolving and evolving. And to get up to the products where the, the ribs in them, that came from, the LBD was the first one, which was, that's what I was asking you about the LBD, little big disc was the first one like that. And the idea was that they, we'd stuck uh, a circuit board and a drive and they were just heating up so much that we just had to dissipate the heat through the sides and we wanted to do it without a fan because the fan was like it's annoying because the fan makes noise you're doing audio and you've got a fan running it's like incredibly annoying so that whole idea was to force the drive into contact and the card as well the board into contact with the heat sink so all the heat would be dissipated at the sides and interestingly enough I mean that was um something that worked for the small product and then for the bigger products we did it again we did it again and it became something of um uh, let's say an aesthetic design language or an aesthetic design feature which as we actually improved uh the products and improved the conductivity of the actual materials you were using and we switched we were using various different aluminium alloys actually the ribs became um well, just like lip service, they weren't actually doing anything anymore because the with actual <laughs> rather disappointingly put it maybe, but for the actual the mass of the of the aluminium was was dissipating the heat enough that we didn't need them. So if you look at the versions, I think the the first version of the of the D two ran from two thousand two to two thousand five two thousand six. Then the ones with the ribs ran from two thousand six through two thousand eight two thousand ten. And then 2014, I did, it. I did the redesign again, which is with the ones without the ribs and with the foot now part of the body so that you can't take the foot off anymore. Uh, next question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've, yeah, I mean, that was sort of, I mean, you uh, leading off uh, there on the next bit I wanted to talk to you about in the fact that you're making the hard drive, an object that you can admire. Like, um, a lot of people have said that in the film that, because um, they've made a lot of sort of associations to sci-fi things, uh, that the, the hard drive appears a bit like the monolith in 2001. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the Kubrick references are there, but the Kubrick reference, again, where that went, the, the, I think the most obvious was the, the, there's another Lassie product called the Five Big, and the Five Big is a, a huge, big aluminium brick with a really big blue eye in it, and then the, your drives that come out the back, uh, five drives that you can interchange, hot swap, and that was very much based. That was that was sort of like taking it further, because that was HAL, and uh, one of the things about that drive is that if it's if it goes down, the big blue eye goes red. Because it means that the drive's gone mad, you know, like and Hal was completely mad. And as well, there's also um, a reference to um, what's he called again? Uh, I can't remember his name. The um, when our hero is extracting the memory from Hal, and Hal's singing "Daisy, Daisy, 
give me your answer true, and he's like spir spiraling down. Um, Bowman, Bowman, that's his name. When Bowman's take, pulling out the, the memory, because if you turn this thing around, the back of it is very much the same sort of idea that you unslot the memory from the back. So that was a, a complete HAL reference. Now the monolith, see the monolith wasn't really that product. The monolith was the design by Neil Poulton uh, product, which is the completely black one. So you take one of these completely black ones and you stick it on its end, you stick it vertically, which I have been known to do. And in fact, I've got like photos and photo montages and things like this with, with that drive-in sort of 2001 settings. That's very much the, mo the monolith. Um, but the, the, the sci-fi thing in it is what it's, if you want to read the sci-fi thing into it, you can. Um, there's other stories that are going on in these products. Um, Apart from just the sort of the, the technological one, but there's an interesting thing that I've I've always been um, intrigued by the relationship between active and passive um, objects, and and I, I refer a lot to um, a text that was written by Charles Jenks about silent butlers, and um, Jenks he compared technology. James was an architect, he's become a, a land architect. But um, this, this, in the mid 80s, there was a magazine called The Postmodern Object. And in that, Jenks wrote an essay. And this essay, which was called The Silent Butler, compared technology to either silent butlers or welcome guests. And so his idea was that technology, which was a silent butler, was like a, like a perfect English butler. So that if you. Um, if your glass was empty, the butler would appear silently behind you and fill your glass up. Or if your cigar needed lighting, lit, lit that the, um, the same the same way it happened, so that the butler was only there when you needed him. And he compared the technology to that, saying, "Well, you had to have technology that isn't obtrusive, that is only there when you actually need it." But Jenks argued that if you do that, then what happens is that you just fill up your entire life with nothingness. Because with all the technology pushed into the walls, and you know, like imagine that you take that a little bit further and you say, well, you push all the technology into the walls. So your lights, the light comes in when you walk through the door. The TV is now um, uh, an OLED system that's, um, that melts into your windows. The, um, the heating system is in the walls. The, um, you know, it's so on and so forth. So you get to the point that all, the te all of your technology well, the service technology disappears, so it becomes silent butlers. But then what that what leaves you with is this complete emptiness. And so Jenks was on, talked about inviting guests to take up the space that you just liberated. And he compared uh, the design of objects to either being the silent butler or either being a welcome guest. And he, and he su suggested or proposed the ratio for this, which is quite an interesting thing. Saying that how many invited guests, which are very attention seeking and which scream and shout and which demand all of your attention, how many uh, invited guests can you have for, for how many silent butlers? I think his ratio was like roughly nine silent butlers to each invited guests. And so, and so then you ask the question so what happens when there's two invited guests or three invited guests? And they, they, the postula on that was that. Once you got past about two invited guests, you might as well invite 20 because the cacophony of, of 20 invited guests reduced it down to nothing. Mm. Uh, anyway, yeah. I, I like, I, I like this, uh, this, this philosophy of designing things that are either invisible or are very present. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, that's, I mean, that seems quite uh, sort of prescient for the film in a, in a way. Uh, uh, and also, <laughs> uh, well, I guess the fact that I've sort of put, you know, obviously you've made this hard drive as a, as a sculptural piece that you notice and, you know, you um, sort of in a way coexist with. But, you know, I, I've really enjoyed sort of making it like, uh, like, I don't know, it's, it's like presenting the landscape against this object in a way, you see. So... You notice differences in the two things by I guess it's a sort of it's using it as a bit of a sculptural language in that way. Is if you place an object in a landscape, what does that say about the landscape? What does that say about the object? So you know, we have sort of 
been having this fairly close relationship, like I said. And also just for when people have seen me film it and walked up and gone, what are you doing? <laughs> and actually me thinking, well, obviously this is a hard drive, but not many people knowing that it's a hard drive. Like, um, maybe they know it's a hard drive, but to see it in that environment, they're just completely yeah, bemused. Like, but you, see, you see, what's quite, quite interesting about that is if you can, if you, th there are some uh, objects which can be reduced down to a couple of lines and um, you, know, you can get an icon for something. Like I'm not talking about an iconic product. I'm talking about like a graphic, you know, like a, a graphic symbol that represents something that um, is very, very clear and very simple and very universal. The telephone used to be like that. And if you even look on, if you look on your screen for this um, FaceTime call, you will see a symbol for a telephone with ends written next to it, which is an old, like, 1970s um, clunk, uh, you know, hard, hard, uh, hard wire uh, dial telephone. Uh, to, uh, today's telephone, there's no graphic icon for it. What's quite interesting about the hard drive is that the hard drive, there's two graphic icons for it. One is the actual, the drive, the internal drive itself, which you'll sometimes see on um, the little desktop icons on your computer. Another one, which has become has become iconic, is the the vertical box with the light in the top of it. And uh, if you look at the number of products that were like copied or inspired or whatever by that configuration that I came up with, it's actually become like a sort of generic um, representation of what a hard drive is. So people say, "Well, this is where I'm going with this." Is that actually people now <laughs> recognise these, these this thing as the thing with the blue light as being a hard drive because it's become itself the de facto um, representation of what a hard drive is in the same way that the, the little uh, turned up telephone receiver with N next to it has become the thing for uh, hanging up a call. Um, technically, I mean, there's no reason that a hard drive can't be any shape you want. And if you look at some of the other Lassie products, I mean, there's the the sphere, the sphere which was done, which I didn't design, which was designed by uh, Christophe. Um, and that's a, a <laughs> just saying, well, your hard drive, it can be any shape. And now with the technology, again, because we're, we're, we're moving more and more towards solid state, um, and it's the only thing holding solid state back, or SSD, is, um, is it's costly. But as we're increasingly going towards that, we should have more liberty to do things that maybe redefine again what, not so much what a hard drive is, because it's no longer going to be a hard drive, but what um, personal storage is. Um, so what is the what is going to be the iconic symbol or graphic for personal storage in the future? Mm. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and also, so you've got some of uh, your lacy designs in the Pompidou, I understand, haven't you? Yes, so, yeah, there are. I mean, how do you see the hard drive as like it's straddling between form and function, you know, a functionless sculptural uh, object and a very, very functional object? I mean, you know, you've already sort of touched on that, I think, speaking to me, but I want to know like your feelings on that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what, they've got a sort of a modern collection and they, um, uh, I think there's, I think there's how many? Five or five? I can't remember. There's a, actually I can, I have to consult my own website to find out how many things are in the, um, <laughs> are in the puppy door. I don't know it off by heart. Um, but the, um, yeah, the, it's very much that sort of recognition of the, of the sort of the, the cultural value of the object as opposed to just being a commercial pra practice. Because I think one thing in, in, in Lassie is Lassie has always been very driven by um, doing its own thing. And um, I, I know there's a, it's kind of got very much tied in with Apple in, the, in you know, these, these last years. And again, the things that Apple have actually copied us, there's, there's not, not always Lassie that is trying to fit in with Apple. Apple have, all, have also been influenced by Lassie. Um, but they, um, they, when you're actually designing it, I mean, like, People always said to me, well, like with the cloud, the hard drives, again, we shouldn't really be calling it a hard drive because of the fact that so much of it is SSD now, but the, um, that the, uh, the hard drive is going to just cease to exist, that nobody would any, need any longer to have physically um, their stockage, external stockage or backup or whatever you want to call it, 
uh, near to them, that everything would, be, everything would be in the cloud. So that you've got these two things that are happening at the moment. There's the actual physical hard drives are moving towards a professional market, and the the normal sort of consumers are going toward to the cloud. And basically, it's because the cloud is de facto imposed on you. You don't have the choice. I mean, in most cases, like the when you get your iPhone, your iPhone's like almost automatically set up to stock all your 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 music and your photos and everything on the cloud. So that it's been this sort of the polarizing of the, of the marketplace, and that physical hard drives are getting more and more and more professional. Which, if you look at the one we just did this thing, well, I just designed this thing that was launched at CES. It's called the Lassie uh, Chromi, which is a, a ridiculous um, piece of technology, uh, just ridiculous. So the, with the uh, Type C connections and and the fastest transfer rate in the history of the universe. Uh, at a price that is just like stupid. And actually these things were done and each one of them is actually individually CNC milled, <laughs> not like molded or injection molded or whatever. And there's only a, th there are only a thousand of them. That, <laughs> but that had like, uh, that was launched in, um, in uh, at the CES, Consumer Electronics Show, in January. And I got like a riotous um, response from, certainly from the press, we got into the Wall Street Journal. It was on TV on uh, America Today. Uh, it's got a lot of, uh, made a lot of noise. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's interesting because that's, again, that's pushing the sculptural thing because it's a very, very simple, simple uh, rectangular form just, uh, you know, posed on its, on its corner, just angled, which makes it in, uh, sort of like a trophy. You look at it and it's like a, you know, <laughs> Here's your, you have won, you have won, here is your trophy, the trophy for your life. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, um, yeah. But that, in terms of the tech, I mean, like, the, if you really just talk down to the, the, the brass knuckles of it, the, the, um, the, the, the problems stay exactly the same, funnily enough, because you would have thought with the, uh, the advances in tech that the, the problems would go away, but the problems are still... Um, well, the cooling and vibration are the, are the big problems. And um, you say, well, okay, well, you know, it's sort of like, a, why is that a problem? Because, you you know, you got a, a bigger drive or 10 times. Well, it's because the, it's it's just scaled up, you know, because before we had, if you look at the cock, the very the cock, the drive at the beginning. So what do you think the um, the biggest size of the cock was in terms of capacity? Uh I don't know, thinking all the way back then. 500 gigabytes? 200 mega. 200 megabytes, wow. <laughs> and that was the biggest one. And, and at that time, there was, um, everybody was like in graphics or in film or anything. Um, they used these cartridges called SideQuest cartridges. You ever heard of SideQuest cartridges? I don't think I have, no. There were big things that looked, they were about a big square cartridge about, um, I don't know, uh, and like 15 centimeters square called the uh, company called SideQuest and one was a 44 mega another one was an 88 mega and these were the industry standard for sending your rushes across town <laughs> and the bike and the bike or send your or send in I'd be honest, it was mostly used for you know doing graphics and stuff but you know when you're sending your your files across town to get them to, to the printer and the guy on the bike would come and pick this up, you know, on the bike, and would bike your 44 mega across town so you get your catalog printed. Uh, so but they, um, what I said is that they, it's just a question of scale, though, because we've still got the same problems. It's just that we but now everybody's doing, you know, so like people said, well, you're, you've got this enormous hard drive, you know, like uh, it's so big. And then somebody comes along and goes, well, now we've got um, 5K, 5K television, and now you've got 8K television. So immediately, your, your enormous hard drive suddenly starts looking very, very small. Mm. So if you, look at, if you look at the enclosure sizes, the enclosure sizes don't really move that much. It's just that we've, we've crammed more and more and more and more and more gigas and terabytes into the, into the actual drive. And the, problems, the, stand, the standard problem I was talking about is the, the coolant, and that's the big one because the thing heats up, and what we tend to do is we tend to have to put a fan in it. And if you've got one drive in your desk and it's got a fan in it, it's not a big deal. But if you go and see some of these rendering parks, 
when they've got like 300 or 400 drives in a line or on shelves in a, in a cupboard. Mm. And all of the, those fans are all going at once. It makes a hell of a noise. Mm. So, so they, um, in terms of the, the, you know, the, the actual physical elements of it, it's always been um, cooling has been the biggest problem, I think. Uh, try, which is why the, the, the drive that you're using has the, the ribs in it, as the, as the, the heat sink. Mm. Kind of like that, I like the idea of the heat sink as well. I've used that again. I used that in a lamp last year because I like this idea of the, um, you know, sort of the, the honesty of the, the technology so that you can actually see what it is rather than having to have that inside it and then putting a skin around it to hide it with. You know, it's very sort of Bauhausian, you know, like very um, well Gropius to do the just to leave the thing as it is. Sorry, did I wander off in the wrong direction? No, this is perfect. I mean, I'm just sort of thinking. I wanted to sort of talk to you. You're, you've already talked about the scale of of um, hard drive technology and data storage technology, but so maybe if I could move on to these sort of general questions about the sort of the, th the thesis of the film. Um, um, in terms of uh, storing endless amounts of sort of information on a hard drive. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I'm quite interested in how you think we'll be able to manage ever increasing quantities of information globally and what impact that's going to have in the end. Well, it's it's at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, the Moore's Law thing doesn't work anymore. And um, there doesn't seem to be any end to either the um, the need for... I want it for higher resolution, and you know, higher resolution means you know bigger, bigger file size. Because I mean, obviously, you know, now we're talking five K, and then eight K, and then I heard um, Samsung were talking about a twelve K TV. Yeah. Um, and uh, once you get past that, if you go to the VR, I mean, like VR is going to demand enormous amounts of storage. Uh, you know, it's like a, you know, storing an entire vat. And to, again, depending on the resolution of your environment, if you want it to be a realistic environment that you're in, you're going to start, you know, it's not going to be like, it's not be like a, you know, a, a mapped, uh, you know, sort of like you know, thing that you get in a, in a shoot em up game just now, which is mapping. I mean, you're going to get, go up to the point of having like, you know, like entire environments where everything's like in 3D. You, know, you imagine that the, 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 the the space, the computing space that that's going to require, and also the computing speed that that's going to require to process it. And you're sort of like you're talking, you know, gigaflops. I don't know, it's like uh, crazy stuff. But the um, so that's one of these things is that if if there had been some sort of um, you know, like ceiling to how much storage people actually needed, um, then the hard drive market would have collapsed a long time ago. But it's kind of like, um, it's uh, how many books can you put in your library? And what do you do when the library's full? You get a bigger library. You know? And it's kind of like that. It just keeps going. And there's just, as I say, the demands, the, the, most, the most demanding uh, consumers are the gamers. Because the gamers need ultra fast speeds. Because if you're like a second slow, you're dead in the game. And and they want the um you know they, they want the, the ultra you know like hyper reality, so the, the the game market is you know going to always going to be like really extreme. After that, after as I said in the consumer market, it's I mean just like stock in stock in five K TV. It's just like you know it's crazy stuff. It takes a lot of space. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess like my next question is like, why do you think we want to? Why do we think we seek to quantify everything around us into digital data? That's, it's, it kind of comes back to that discussion I was talking about, about the Charles Jenks thing. Because if you can imagine that your silent butlers are, are now all your digital material, so it physically doesn't have any presence. I mean, physically. I mean, your, your entire record collection, physically, if you had records, it takes up a lot of space. You know, it's like physically imposing. Whereas you're the same stuff as MP3s, I mean, the MP3 is in the cloud. It's, it's, you don't even have it. It's, there's no physical uh, presence at all. So you could say that in a certain way that the um, digital is your silent butler and analog is your invited guests. And um, I think that there's, uh, there's going to be always going to be a, a need for the physicality of things, um, which 
I think it's different to nostalgia. At the moment, for example, the, if you talk about vinyl records, I mean, vinyl records are selling, they say, better than they've ever sold. Well, ever sold, but better than they've ever sold in the last 15, 20 years. And I myself, I'm a big vinyl uh, aficionado. I don't know how to say words anymore. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I buy a lot of records. And a lot of these rec the records have download codes in it, which is kind of, you know, you get, you get your, your cake and you can eat it too. The, um, the, you know, because you get the download code, so you've got it on your 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 phone, and you've got physically, you've got this nice sort of like physical souvenir of the object. One of the big problems with the facility that digital provides is that it often provides the same content at a lesser quality. And I think the most flagrant um, example of that is the MP3 which the MP3 has become just so convenient. Everybody uses it, and the quality of an MP3 is just atrocious. I mean, you have to have really have cloth ears not to be able to hear the difference. Um, hmm. So it's, it's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm pro, I'm pro digital because of, of the convenience of it, but it's in terms of, of uh, um, I think it's the, the, the lack of immersion in digital today which I find um, wanting and that's why I'm a big uh, I've got big hopes for for virtual reality what, the, what, the, what the VR can do because if you get if you can get the, the feedback and so that now instead of drawing with your Apple pencil on a sheet of glass you are now actually in a field and you are painting on a on a uh, on a canvas and you have the, the sensation of the brush and of the movement of the brush and of the paper. And so you can get that point. If it can be as immersive as that, I think that could be incredible. But I think that the, the need to have something physical which represents the experience is quite human. Um, and that's the reason why people buy souvenirs. You know, that's why you go to someone and you buy a T-shirt. It's this, it's, it's kind of like a, I think it must be a sort of like a mammalian brain or a reptilian hind brain sort of thing that's hardwired in us, that we like to have artifacts that represent experiences, physical artifacts. And also I think, um, I don't know whether that's something about, you know, who we're making these products for. We, you know, we don't want a society, a broken world in which to, put these products into, if you see what I mean. So that we need to assess, you know, um, the, uh, our morality in many ways. That's a, that, that's a very, well, that's a very interesting point because if you, if I wonder what an iPhone will represent in like 50 years time, will an iPhone represent a, a period of, you know, represent the height of technology for a period and the, you know, sort of the, the most sophisticated devices we've ever created, or will it represent? A, will it be a symbol of slavery? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, or will it be a symbol of like mad consumerism? Yeah. Uh, it's a, because I mean, like in, in terms of the statistics, they're, they're pushing out for phones now. I mean, I heard that, you know, that, that there's now there are now more uh, smartphones on the planet than there are toilets. I'm not entirely sure how they come up with that statistic, but it's quite interesting th an interesting thought. <laughs> well, maybe when everyone's sat on the toilet using their smartphone, <laughs> there's some people no, who can't go to the toilet. <laughs> no, but I, th I think there's one of these, 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 these things that getting back to what I was saying about the cloud, I think it seems to be coming that there are uh, more places that have um, telephone coverage than have run in war. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's sort of like a, something really to think about. I mean, with a, uh, it's like a, you go somewhere, there's no, there's no Kazi, but everybody's got their smartphone. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm completely off topic now. Um, where, where were we? I've I, I really just started warbling here. No, no, I think we're <laughs> everywhere at the moment. It's great. I bet that you get it on. But, um, I mean, we've had a fascinating conversation. I feel like you're sort of, they're going to be key to bringing Lassie, 
No, I got it at that time. <laughs> uh, hard drive alive. So yeah, really appreciate that, Neil. Thank you very much. Okay, nice to have spoken to you. Yeah, okay. cheers, you too. Goodbye. Okay, bye.